Hi, this is James Mitchell, author of The Walrus and the Elephants, John Lennon's Years of Revolution, and you're listening to Things We Said Today with Steve Marinucci and Ken Michaels. Hello, hello, and welcome again to another edition of a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about what's going on news-wise in the world of the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show. Some of you know me for another Beatles program that I host called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by my co-host, the uh, ever-present newsman on the Beatles, (laughs) <laughs> and everybody, being, everybody else, too. For yeah. that I've been writing a lot of other stuff this week. That being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. On today's show, we have a special guest with us on the phone, and he has authored a number of Beatle books. You're probably familiar with uh, a couple of Fab Four FAQ books that he put out. Uh, one was just called Fab Four FAQ, another Fab Four FAQ 2.0. And then there was another book on the Beatles' Revolver album, that he put out a couple of years ago, and now he has yet but another book uh, on the Beatles, and this is on their solo years. It's actually called Solo in the 70s, John, Paul, George, and Ringo, 1970 to 1980. We welcome Robert Rodriguez to the show. Hi, Robert. Hi, Ken. Hi, Steve. Hey, uh, Robert. I'd like to um, just start off the conversation by um, bringing up the format of this, of this book, because uh, what makes your book so delightful to read is the format. It, this is very much like your Fab Four books in, in a number of ways because you have a number of chapters in there with different themes. And it makes it um, a much easier read. It's not like it's a book where you have to go from page one to the very end. You can just pick whatever chapter you want to delve into depending upon your level of interest in whatever the subjects are. For example, I'm just going to mention a few things uh, that you cover in this book. You've got promo films, court cases that took place in the 70s, uh, one called Business Associates, Friends, Lovers, and Others, covers of solo songs from other artists in the 70s, the U.S. versus John Lennon, dealing with the, the immigration problems that he had, uh, protégés of the Beatles, tracks left in the can. That's what makes this uh, a very enjoyable read for me and for, for many of your, your fans. Well, thanks, Ken. Yeah, it, it's, you know, especially when you're covering four separate careers as well as this overshadowing Beatle presence that lingered on throughout the decade. You know, it's a lot of information that I wanted to get into the book, and I felt the best way to do it was to sort of deconstruct the story, kind of like I did with the previous two FAQ books, because it's not going to be a straightforward narrative with an arc from start to finish, although, you know, you can look for one, but to me, it was more important to attune it to the reader's expectations and what they might be wanting to go to first as far as one aspect or another of the Beatles' career during those times, you know, whether it be album cover art or, you know, like some of the things you said, promo films or, you know, just other things that, you know, you can just zero right in on. And, you know, 500 pages is a lot of material. So hmm. I wanted people to be able to pick it up and put it down as they had time to read it. Right. Well, just, just uh, as a side note, that's one of the aspects that I like about this book because there are a lot of, in particular, uh, people, in the Beatles' lives that we've all heard about but may not know all that much about, but we have some level of interest in them. Let's just say it's the band Attitudes, which you bring up in the book, a band that was on George's Dark Horse label. Instead of doing a whole chapter on them, you say everything that you need to say in two or three pages. And that's really how you approach just about every subject uh, in this book. So I think uh, for a lot of people, it's it's an easy read. Yeah, you know, it's kind of a challenge to sort of straddle the line between giving it enough basic information for somebody that might be new to the subject to want to come in and get a handle on what they need to know in this story of the post-Beatles decade, but also have enough stuff in there to satisfy the hardcores because, you know, I, I've got plenty of friends in my life that, like me, know every aspect of the Beatles' career and, you know, have read every book and listened to every bootleg and all that. But you still want to be able to surprise them and come up with stuff that, you know, from digging into the research, something that surprises yourself as you're doing the research. And so it's kind of a fine line to make it not too much inside baseball, but also give everybody the basic information that they should know. Hmm. I I have to agree with Ken on that because 
say it's an easy it, it is an easy read and it's also something you can I mean, I like like he said, you can just open the page, open a page, and find something interesting to read. I remember taking Fab Four FAQ on a plane with me one time, and it was just great to be able to not uh, just to be able to go through piece by piece. But let me ask you, one of the interesting things that you you have a chapter they weren't the Beatles of bands that would have been, I mean, that weren't the Beatles obviously, but you put Wings in there. I thought that was kind of interesting. Why why Wings in in the they weren't the Beatles chapter? Just because there were people that came of age during the decade of the 70s covered in the book that might have been at too big of a distance from the Beatles phenomenon and didn't experience it firsthand. And here was Wings, this fresh act, you know, from 1972 through the end of 1980, that, you know, to them it was a new band making new music, and they didn't have that, that whole uh, cachet of knowing Paul McCartney's career before that. So they could approach it like any other fresh act on the radio. And, you know, that was how they accepted it and dealt with it. You know, it was a band that you could potentially see live in 1976. And they just had this very successful chart run throughout the decade. So, you know, it, and it was some, it was an act, as I point out in the book, that, you know, certainly John Lennon, when he was, you know, doing his normal sort of trash talking of, you know, living in the past, was like, you know, if you need the Beatles, go out and see Winks. It was, I think, for a lot of people, sort of a, a substitute on some level for the place that the Beatles occupied. If you really needed to recapture some of that, you know, Beatles spirit that you might have missed out on, you know, that was the next closest thing. It wasn't like George Harrison, you know, he did one show in '71, then did one tour. I mean, Beatles or Wings were pretty reliable and act. But they always had some product coming out and were playing live somewhere in the world. Yeah, it's one thing that we brought up a number of times here on this show how. Paul in particular, you could say all the Beatles, they they all were able to get a new audience in the 70s that didn't really know about their Beatle past because their hits were played on Top 40 radio and you had a lot of young people listening who really didn't know about these four guys in the 60s, but especially in the case of Paul. Mm-hmm. That joke that uh, you know, floated around in the 70s, that, did you know that Paul was in a band before Wings? Well, just the mere fact that that joke existed tells you something. Yes. Right. Um, I'm just going to nitpick a few things. There's so many things I'd love to mention from your book, but uh, some little facts here I just wanted to question you about. You said that uh, John considered uh, another studio album after Walls and Bridges provisionally titled Between the Lines. Yes. I hadn't heard that before. Where did you, where did you find that out? Hmm. I'm trying to remember in the course of my research, if it was Derek Taylor, it was somebody inside that John had mentioned it to that said that. And in fact, we, as we know, come the Lost Lennon tapes, there was songs that he was demoing in preparation for that record, some of them not even fully fleshed out yet, that ended up being completed and fleshed out and used on the Double Fantasy record, his next album of original material, five years on. Hmm. You know, just you just reminded me of something. There was a musical that John and Yoko were supposedly working on called The Ballad of John and Yoko. And a yes. number of the songs that were in the Lost Lennon tapes were going to be used in there. Do you know more about what songs were planned for that musical? Uh, I believe Real Love was part of that. There's various iterations of that that he recorded. You know, the one that was used in the Imagine documentary in 1988 versus the one that the Treadles used as the basis of their recording in 1995. Hmm. Um, I didn't get into that a whole lot in the book, mostly because I felt that was something that its story came later on when eventually she recovered the manuscript of Sky writing by word of mouth, and that talks about it, and you know, it was more of an 80s, 90s thing. Yeah, it's just very interesting because, as you pointed out in your book, and I've said in the past on my radio shows, when John said in 1980 that he literally didn't take the guitar off the wall for five years, you know that that just wasn't true. Just uh, right. as and evidence, a lot of you know his, his posturing during those interviews that I point out in the book. I, I, when you look at the pattern of what he was saying privately versus publicly, I really do think he was making this effort to, to sort of push Yoko out from his shadow as an artist in her own right, whose time had come. You know, 1980, where you know, that sort of edgy raw material that she was crafting for the Double Fantasy album was very much in vogue. And the, and the very last thing he did was working on the Walking on the Ice single that he was convinced would be her first number one and would really break her as a solo artist. Okay. 
that's that's interesting. Um, let me let me ask a, a question off of that in regards to Paul and Linda. Um, it's always been kind of my feeling that one of the reasons that Linda was brought into Wings was because Yoko was working with John. Do you agree with that, or is that does that make sense, or? It's sort of a, a I can do what you're doing kind of right. thing. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's the way it was definitely received at the time. I don't think, I mean, you know, clearly, if you look at the pattern of John Lennon's artistry, it, it was like, you know, one of the things that really made the Beatles what they were. You could say it generally for the four of them, but I think John in particular, of never wanting to repeat themselves and always want to move on to the next new thing as their sound evolved. You know, it was very much part of their personas and their personalities, if not to repeat a triumph. And I think it was a very logical step in John's thinking when he started bringing Yoko around in 1968, you know, that why not make her part of the Beatles? You know, why not bring her in and jam with them and, you know, let her sound be added to the mix? You know, and he wanted to do that with Billy Preston come January 69, bring him in and make him a Beatle. You know, he was always looking to, you know, pick up some kind of added thing to advance his music so not to do the same stale thing over and over again right so i i think he very much saw yoko as you know as he was getting ready to leave the beatles as where his future lay was where she had her musical stylings such as they were as something that he could work with and they could do their joint things like they did in toronto and move on with you know paul didn't have that same sort of mindset i think his thing was he very much needed that psychological boost of having somebody around to support him from this very dark place he was at come the end of 1969 going into 1970. And, you know, as he wrote it, maybe I'm amazed. You know, she pulled him out of that funk, and he just really needed that prop as something to support as he, you know, picked himself up and dusted himself off to face life post-Beatles. So they had different roles than respective spouses did in their partner's lives, but uh, whether it was just like a purposeful, well, you're working with your wife, now I'm going to work with my wife, I'm not sure. I think that he needed her for his own reasons that weren't necessarily the same reasons John wanted Yoko around. Yeah, really, he, yeah, Linda's role was so different from what Yoko's was to John. I mean, Yoko was an artist in her own right, and John wanted yes. Yoko to stand out that way, whereas Linda was really there to support Paul yeah. in Wings. And, so. you know, musically, there, there's really not a whole lot expected, you know, no heavy lifting. Although, as I point out in the book, when she, they got into the trouble with ATV and Lou Grade about her songwriting capabilities, I think that really kind of forced the issue you know, of making her something more than a potted plant on stage that she really needed to you know, maybe step up and justify her role in the band. But you know, it is no small sign of what she was willing to endure for love of Paul, what she had to put up with just by mm-hmm. being in that group and being on stage, you know, something she hadn't been groomed for you know, for the years prior to joining Wings. You know, she was a photographer. It wasn't like she did any concerts whatsoever, and suddenly she's thrown in the deep end. I want to bring up something here for which i got to tell you, Robert, uh, on a scale of of 1 to 5, I give your book a 10 just for this one quote. (laughs) It has to do with Yoko. And um, I'm going to read this right from the book. This is on page 107. You write, just as it's a mistake to fall into the Yoko broke up the Beatles mindset, The truth is far more complex than that. Does anyone really believe that they would have stayed together if John hadn't met her? I thought that was brilliant. (laughs) Just for you to say that. I never heard anybody else say that, and and I'm kind of surprised I never thought that way myself, but I I have to agree with you 100%. There were a lot of reasons why the Beatles broke up, and I've always said it was a complex situation. Oh, sure. You know, if you really want to nitpick, you can say she didn't help them, you know, stay together. And I think that was part of John's passive aggressive you know, acting in bringing her around and sort of foisting her on his bandmates. You know, and what had been Sacrosac before that, it was just the four Beatles, no outsiders, and suddenly they were joined at the hip. But, you know, there was any number of reasons, and I talked about this a little bit in the Revolver book, that, you know, early 1966, as part of that same Maureen Cleave interview, you know, the more popular than Jesus one, you know, there's, to me, a far more significant quote out of John where he talks about, you know, here he is at the height of his success. You know, they wanted to be bigger than Elvis. They wanted to be the golf and the king of England. They succeeded beyond anyone's wildest expectations. And here he is at the top of the, you know, Beatles' successes, and he goes, whatever I was meant to do, this isn't it, which is why I dabble in painting and writing and filmmaking, but this isn't for me. 
And this is before they went into studios to make Revolver. But I think that's really, you know, the the passing of the torch moment in the Beatles' career from John driving their artistic engine to Paul. And from then on, he was really more interested in his own, discovering his own voice as an artist in whatever form that took. Yeah. And, you know, whatever, you know, you say the end of touring set up their demise or the death of Brian, I think those were all aspects. But really, you can trace it to that period where as he's starting to withdraw from the Beatles, what they did from that point on was less than fully optimal Beatles. Because if John was not fully engaged, you know, that's what she ended up with. You know, Paul was driving things from 67 onward. But, you know, you look at Sgt. Pepper, and is that, you know, would you consider that a fully blown Beatle album compared to Revolver? You know, it, it, the, the four-headed monster ended with Revolver, in my view. And it was Paul, to varying extent, George Martin, you know, John, if he could be shamed into writing new material or get engaged, you know, from moment to moment. George discovering his own voice as an artist. You know, it, it's it's... The, the craftsmanship was always there. The, the music never diminished in quality. But as far as the height of all four Beatles pulling in the same direction, I think it really did crest in 66. Hmm. Very interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Let me ask a question about Elephant's Memory, Robert. You talk, we talked about this recently with James Mitchell um, on his, with his book. Mm-hmm. And, and um, you also have basically the same opinion that they've been been um, criticized probably more than they should be. Um, yes. Talk about that. I, I think that, you know, it, it, they got thrown into the deep end pretty quickly of, you know, once he was turned on to them and started jamming with them, you know, it was more a marriage of necessity at the onset because he needed a band beyond Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman and whoever was playing bongos to do the gigs that he wanted to do. And so they were a capable band, you know, they were simpatico politically and, it was something that made sense to him. He wanted a good, gritty street band. You have to have a sax player that evokes the whole 50s sound that he was so in love with. So it made sense. I think they started putting out product maybe before they really had the time to gel as a band that they might have. But, you know, you look at some of the last collaborative stuff done between the Lennons and Elephant's Memory, and I point to the approximately Infinite Universe album, that playing is just brilliant. Those musical backings are just First rate. It's hard to imagine a better rocking setting for Yoko to do her thing over. Those guys, I think, got her. It's too bad that you know things went sideways years later when they put out the live album. But um, you know, I think that she would have done well to continue working with those guys because she got so much out of them, even better than what the, the studio players she got for feeling the space. Hmm. Yeah, approximately Infinite Universe is my favorite Yoko album. So many brilliant songs yeah. on there. I want to bring up something which I was kind of surprised when I read this, and may, you'll have to clear this up, because there's a picture in here of John's green card. Yes. And right underneath this, you wrote, I'm going to read this straight from the book, it took over four years, but in the end, the fight to obtain this legitimizing little document was a hard one but sweet victory. Though fans can be forgiven for believing, in the end, John would have been better off had he been deported. Yes. What did you mean by that? Simply that perhaps any other corner of the world but the streets of New York City would have been a safer place for him to be. You know, he got comfortable, too comfortable in New York. And it's something I alluded to in the 2.0 book where the people around him sort of marveled at what they thought was kind of reckless, how careless he was about his own safety Hmm. and just, you know, approaching people he found interesting in the street and walking around without any kind of guard around him at all. You know, not that anybody thought that there was such a thing as celebrity assassination going on for much of the decade, but, you know, you never knew what would happen. And the streets of New York, as I point out, were you know, a dangerous place. You know, you had the, the murder of King Curtis in 1971, you know, over nothing. I mean, random stuff just happened. Hmm. And, you know, it's the kind of thing where, you know, if, if John had been living anywhere other than New York City, you know, maybe things wouldn't have played out the way they did. Yeah, that's just from reading that statement, I couldn't pick that up as though you were referring to John getting killed in New York. I didn't know that's what you meant. Yeah. Robert, um, getting back to, to uh, Yoko again, how do you put Yoko's music in perspective in, in in general in general terms? I mean, a lot of people there are a lot of people that still today don't understand what she's up to. How do you characterize that? Well, she suffers in 
you know, being this apples and orange equation by being, you know, in such proximity to the most accessible pop rock act in rock history. You know, everything they touched was engaging and enjoyable and, you know, with just ear candy. You know, a lot of it with some great depth to it as well. And here she is, you know, not fitting any prior rock paradigm. You know, this experimental stuff originally not even with lyrics to it, just the, the screechy stuff that people still to this day characterize her as producing. You know, had she not been married to a Beatle, and she was just somebody that came along during that era, she would have been one more act that would have been a niche act, would not have been meant for top 40 airplay whatsoever. And if there's any number of acts that are lionized today for the influence they had on later generations, whether it's the MC5 or the Velvet Underground or the Mothers of Invention, you know, there's any number of acts that do stuff that doesn't fit that that pop sensibility. And yet there's stuff to come that to draw from it. And certainly I think time has borne that out in Yoko's case with some of the electronica stuff, some of the stuff she did that was just sort of sound collage stuff. I mean, people picked up on it. People were listening to that stuff, and it manifested itself in maybe more accessible form years later. You know, that is, you know, she has to endure the burden of being married to one of the Beatles, and that automatically will set her up for a lot of animosity for not being, you know, what people thought John Lennon should be with and for not being this accessible pop artist. I mean, I don't know what she could have sounded like that people would have accepted, but the fact that her stuff was so way out in left field made her a much harder sell. And quite frankly, you know, she didn't have the temperament to play the game that might have made her people a little more forgiving of her. But it doesn't matter. There's validity to her work. And I would rank her work, you know, we talked about approximately Infinite Universe, you know, I put Fly up there too. As another mm-hmm. album, mm-hmm. or why off Plastic Ono Band? I like I like Plastic Ono Band. I think Plastic Ono Band is is absolutely astounding. Sure, and, and it's groundbreaking. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Ken, because we're kind of pressed for time here. If you could, could you just give us your idea of if you could pick each of the four Beatles, what you would say would be their top three albums of the seventies, in your estimation, and why? My top three albums of the uh, the four Beatles. From the 70s? From each of the four. Yeah. Okay. Start with Paul. Ram, I always thought was his overlooked masterpiece. Mm-hmm. You know, it did well at the time chart-wise. It never really got its due. It was kind of, you know, he, he walked away from it. He, having been so invested in it when he created it, and then he immediately spins off that uh, Frillington thing as if to underscore the musicality going on. But then he gets sidetracked with Wings and, you know, didn't really revisit it too much after that. Almost as if he was embarrassed about it, which is too bad. Hmm. Uh, I would put that up there for Paul. Um, you know, Band on a Run, you can't overlook because that was the thing that really put it back in the game as a sustained piece of work. I've always held the theory that, you know, musical artists, when they're put with their backs against the wall, oftentimes come up with the goods by digging deeper than they might ordinarily. And I, I also think that Band on a Run is a better album than it would have been had Henry McCullough and. Um, uh, Denny Sywell not quit because I think that Paul was forced to work a little harder. So you got those two. Um, Wings Over America, I don't know if that counts, but to me, there's so much on that album that is superior live to the studio recordings, particularly the songs from Speed of Sound that just came to life live. Um, and, and then Venus you got and Mars, Maybe I'm too. Amazed. Yeah. It's a different treatment than the studio one-man band recording from 1970. But it definitely, it, it's like two different animals, and they're both equally good. And we were talking Let's about talk. uh, Wings Over America when the remaster came out, and we were saying, uh, I know I certainly feel that uh, the Venus and Mars material sounds so much better live, like Letting Go, oh, for yeah. example. Mm-hmm. Venus and Mars is an album that I think it was a really good album in that it really held together well as a collection of songs. You can nitpick over individual qualities, you know, like Magneto went to Kenya Man or something like that, but, you know, I, I thought... Call Me Back Again was superb. But as you say, it's even better on the Wings Over America album. Hmm. And you know, I never thought sonically it sounded all that great. So I'm really looking forward to the remaster of that. And hopefully they'll you know, fix that. Um, so there's Paul. Ringo. You know, I, I think you can't avoid the Ringo album. Mm-hmm. Start to finish, you know, it was his great blessing to find a producer that understood his gifts. 
you know, she don't market him or present him as a singer per se, as much as a personality. You know, build sympathetic surroundings to him, get some good players, some songs that really fit this persona that he projected, the star quality, and you can't go wrong. You know, Richard Perry understood that and did beautifully by him. Um, moving away from the Perry template, I think R- Ringo's Roto Gravier, which more or less adhered to it, never really got it to do. I think there's some great songs on that album. And, you know, by that time, the, the formula was wearing thin. And I think it's not doing as well as the Apple products that preceded it made them recalibrate the approach for Ringo the Fourth and to nobody's benefit. And then for the third Ringo, I would say Buku's of Blues. You know, this genre exercise that totally suited his skill set. You know, it, country, especially that authentic kind of country, as opposed to what passes for country today, you know, it really fit him well. And the fact that most people, I think, that would have been inclined to buy a Ringo album had more pop rock sensibilities were kind of put off or left cold by it. Even John said he wasn't as embarrassed by that one as he was by Sentimental Journey. But <laughs> I really think that if you give it a chance, some really good stuff there. I kind of wish George. he'd make another another country album. Absolutely, and I'm really shocked that he hasn't. And, it, and it's just incredible to me that in you know, 2014, who would have thought that the uh, surviving Beatle with the best voice would be Ringo? He's got it in. Oh, whoa, I hope he does. whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying that to the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> All due respect to Paul. When when we get to part two of this interview, <laughs> we're going to elaborate on that. Okay, okay, let's do George now. Okay, George. You, you can't avoid all things must pass. Just a masterful, masterful work. Um, he's talented. I've been hiding in plain sight all those years. And this is the thing. This is, I have a theory about that. It's like I think on some level, whether he's conscious or not, he really was looking for validation from the world that he was the equal of John and Paul. With that album, he got it. And I don't think he ever dug as deep again to create such a master work. There's other albums he created that he was fully invested in, such as Living in the Material World, but I don't think he was swinging for the fences the way he was with All Things Must Pass. Hmm. Well, he, he, he felt he had a lot to prove at that point. Yeah, and I think probably... that he, he succeeded and achieved that goal, and afterwards he was creating more for his own interests, you know, what he wanted to put out and didn't weigh in as much the either commercial considerations or I have to outdo John and Paul. I think he felt he did it. Hmm. And, you know, the world certainly concurred with that. Um, 33 and a third. Great album. That's the album he should have toured on. That's the album that should have been the Dark Horse tour. That's the album that was upbeat, engaging, catchy, sense of humor, voice intact, you know, what a different career he might have had had he gone on tour with that album in hand and being in a better place. So do you prefer the more commercial, George, than the more spiritual? I think he can do both. I think that, you know, I w- it, it's hard for me to pick a third album because I'm kind of torn between the self-titled one from 79 and living in the material world. I think I, I, there's not really been a George Harrison solo album that truly disappointed me. I think there's some things that are overlooked. I like Dark Horse better than most people do, I think. I think song for song, it's got a lot of good stuff there. I, I think maybe he rushed the production, and with a little more care, it might have been a little more solid ground. I could certainly live without Bye Bye Love, but I think there's some great tunes there, perform very well. Yeah, I know you ripped that song apart in the book. <laughs> Which one? Oh, with Bye Bye, Bye, Bye Love, Love, yeah. Yeah, yeah it just didn't need to be there. I would have rather had I Don't Care Anymore in this place, actually. Okay. But that's me. And John? John. I would have to go with Plastic on the Bands, like most people would, as a landmark achievement. Once again, something that you can only do once. You know, you get that kind of stark production with such personal music out there. You know, there's no way to repeat that formula. You've done it. It's a one-of-a-kind statement, and you have to move on from there. I think Imagine's got some good songs on it, but it's not. I'm not thrilled with the production on that. So I would skip that. I would go you know, Walls and Bridges. I would put the equal of anything he ever did. I think it's plastic ono band type material with the accessibility where he'd reached the crest of his skill set as a producer. You know, coming off the Nilsson stuff, you know, having gotten mind games in and out of his system. I think he'd really, you know, reached his stride as a producer and able to not sugarcoat, but make the stuff more presentable and accessible. And I think it's a great, great album that it's too bad he dissed it so much 
once he was back with Yoko and promoting Double Fantasy. It was a semi-sick craftsman statement. I think doesn't gel. Mind Games, I think, is another overlooked album, but it benefited from when they put out the remixes in 2006, and suddenly you're hearing things that weren't always apparent, like the organ part on the title track. Mm. I think that's an album that, with a little more care, could have been regarded as good as anything else he did. I think that the songs are there, and it's it's another one that I think you know definitely got undervalued in the marketplace at the time. But just in general, I think it's one tend, that people tend to overlook. I agree. Mind Games is my favorite album of his, mainly because oh. I think I think most people aren't aware of all the great songs that are on there. And uh, you know, you take a look at songs like Out the Blue, which I think is one of the greatest yeah. love songs he's ever done. I know, I know, Absolutely. which has a ma- amazing an amazing bass line in there. And I know, mm-hmm. I know, which really helps the song. I never had that much of a problem with the production, but I know what you're saying about the remaster. You hear a lot more on that album than you yeah. did with the original mix. Um, I, definitely, I assume Ascend, the the lead guitar solo from David Spinoza, is amazing. Intuition, you know, has that mm-hmm. being for the benefit of Mr. Kite feel. You know, this, this I what's that? Yeah, I, I really love that whole album. I think song yeah, per song, I like every single song. Meat City is a great rocker. I have, to, I have to concur about Plastic Ono. I mean, that is just astounding. I, I, re, I wore through, uh, literally wore through a, my vinyl copy, my first vinyl copy, copy of that thing. It, it, uh, it's amazing. And I like Mind yeah, Games. I like main, Mind Games too. That's a, uh, another good one. Hmm. So, I was gonna, I was gonna briefly, if, one last question. I was gonna, I thought the Fred Seaman section in the book was interesting. And when, and you didn't mention that he was the source of the John Lennon repl- uh, story that he was coming conservative. Did, yes. Um, and I, I, I kind of looked at that as maybe a little bit of revenge. Do you think so? To, to... It, 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 that's certainly yeah. I mean, it seems to have been just thrown out there with so little thought that there'd be a million people coming out of the woodwork to refute that. Mm-hmm. You know, it just it just sort of came and went. You know, it was a meme for a day or two, and it kind of faded away. So, you know, it didn't really stick. That said, uh, without naming names, I've, I've been around people that are utterly convinced that it's true. And I think that's really more of a wishful thinking people from that end of the political spectrum that really, really love John Lennon and want to believe that that's true. Right. I, I know what you're talking about, too, because, yeah, yeah, that, I, and that story was just, I remember I wrote a long column about that at the time and how ridiculous mm. that, that idea was. I think, you know, John and Yoko were so much on the same wavelength politically Mm -hmm. that you follow what Yoko has been doing and what she's supporting through the years. That would be pretty much what John would be doing. And that would be very much on the liberal side. So, yeah, I I, I think uh, John would be fully on board with the anti-fracking campaign. Yeah. Oh, I I know he would. He may have mellowed a little bit, you know, at this point in his life, Mm -hmm. but I don't think he would have mellowed that much. He would have. I mean. You can see other people, you know, other people, politically aware people from the 60s that have kind of turned a, a slight corners, but not have gone all, you know, have not definitely turned uh, conservative, would not be watching Fox News now. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. that's just an absurd, a very absurd thought that he yes. would be doing that. There definitely were things that came out of his mouth that seemed to be just for the sake of being provocative that I don't believe he truly meant or believed, even if he was just saying it with utter conviction one moment. Like once he had time to think about it, he was like, yeah, okay, I got to understand it. Like, you know, the uh, thing that comes to mind is in the Playboy interview where he talks about not believing in evolution. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Why aren't monkeys turning into people now? Right. Well, John, because it's not how evolution works. That's how well, Robert, we we definitely have to have you back for another show because unfortunately we got to cut this short. But it's been great having you here. And once again, the name of your new book is called Solo in the Seventies: John, Paul, George, and Ringo, nineteen seventy to nineteen eighty. I highly recommend picking it up. And thanks for being our guest. Thanks for having me. Loved it, and can't wait to come back. Okay. And I, I I repeat Ken's comment. It was, and uh, looking through the book, uh, there's a lot of great information in there. So I okay, also recommend it. Okay, so for things we said today, I'm Ken Michaels, thanking all of you for listening, and we'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci for things we said today, saying thank you, Robert Rodriguez, and we will see you next time.